Hello, I'm Tom Gregory with Youngstown Christian Television. Thanks for joining us on the YouTube channel here and watching the program that you're about to see. Before you do that, if you could hit the subscribe button and join us, that way you'll always be informed of what's going on with Youngstown Christian Television every time we put a new video up on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. What's the real story? How did all of this come to be? Was it all by chance, or did something or someone design everything? Can we use science to prove that God created all that we have? How old is our world and the universe? Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story. Welcome to Discovering His Story, an attempt to integrate the biblical record with the record of ancient history. I'm Bill Henry and I'm your instructor for this production of Youngstown Christian Television. Today we're going to be looking at the most ancient of civilizations following the flood. But before we do that, I want us to draw back a little bit and get some perspective. And so we're looking at when we're looking at history, we're looking at the totality of what God's plan is. And so we are seeing that God is working through His people throughout history. And so we have church history in a nutshell, if you will. And as we look at that, we see that all of history can be divided into that which was from creation to the cross, a time of anticipation of the coming of the seed promised in Genesis 3.15, and then following that cross, uh, we reflect back on what occurred there as the, the, the major point in history and looking forward to the fulfillment of the consummation of all things. But going back to where we left last time, we are looking at the Tower of Babel, thinking about that and the confusion of languages that was there. And I wanted to point out to you uh, a number of the stories about a global flood and a surviving family uh, which are worldwide. Uh, last time we looked at the uh, worldwide flood and, and the many different stories that are told throughout the world and, and almost every major civilization in history. And the same is true of the Tower of Babel. Uh, first of all, in North America, there's a legend of the Maidu Indians of California that says that everybody spoke the same language until during preparations for a special burning ceremony, when suddenly in the night, everybody began to speak in a different tongue, except that each husband and wife talked the same language. Then, according to the legend, God instructed a leader named Kuksu, who could speak all the languages, to summon all the people together and teach them the names of the different animals and so forth in their various dialects. Then he called each tribe by name, and sent them off in different directions, telling them where they were to dwell. Interesting story, somewhat similar to the account we have in the Bible. Then we move down to Central America, and there there's an Aztec legend that says this, Humanity was wiped out by a flood, but one man, Coxcoxtil, and one woman, uh, I better not try to say her name. <laughs> anyway, this man and woman escaped in a boat, and they reached a mountain called Colhuacan, they had many children who were dumb until the time when a dove on top of a tree made them the gift of languages. But these differed so much that the children could not understand each other. That's their interpretation of what occurred at Babel. Now in Guatemala, the Quiches of, of Guatemala told of a time when the tribes multiplied and left their old home to a place called Tulan. Here the language changed and the people sought new homes in various parts of the world as a result of not being able to understand each other. We move over to Africa. A legend of the Wasania tribe in East Africa says that of old, all the tribes of the earth knew only one language, but that during a severe famine, the people went mad and wandered in all directions, jabbering strange words, and so the different languages arose. From there, we go over to India. 
There, the Makir tribe in northeastern India tells of the descendants of Ram, who were strong men and were growing dissatisfied with earth and aspired to conquer heaven. They began to build a tower. It says, higher and higher rose the building, till at last the gods and the demons feared lest these giants should become the masters of heaven, as they already were of earth. So they confounded their speech and scattered them to the four corners of the world. Hence arose all the various tongues of mankind. Now as we move over to Europe, the Greeks had a legend that for many ages men lived without cities and without laws in peace, speaking one language and ruled by Zeus alone. At last Hermes, pictured here, introduced diversities of speech and divided mankind into separate nations. We move over to Polynesia on the island of Hual. They said that Rata and his three sons survived a great flood. Then they made an attempt to erect a building by which they could reach the sky and see the creature god Vatea. But the god in anger chased the builders away, broke down the building, and changed their language so that they spoke diverse tongues. Moving over to the Middle East, we find in the land of Sumer, which we're going to examine very shortly, that the Sumerians believed that all people spoke one language, as claimed in the poem, and Merkar and the Lord of Arata. It says this, In those days the whole universe, the people in unison, Anki, the Lord of Abundance, changed the speech in their mouths and brought contention into it, into the speech of man that until then had been one. Looking over at Southeast Asia, in the country of uh, what used to be called Burma, now called Myanmar, there's a legend of the Gaikho tribe, which says this. In the days of Pandan Man, the people determined to build a pagoda that should reach up to heaven. When the pagoda was halfway up to heaven, God came down and confounded the language of the people so that they could not understand each other. Then the people scattered, and Thron Maurai, the father of the Gaikho tribe, came west with eight chiefs and settled in the valley of the Satang. Now, uh, it's amazing that there are so many stories, again, that talk about this Tower of Babel experience, the changing of the languages. And so many of the facts are the same as what we find in the record in Genesis, although, of course, changing through time are many of the facts. Uh, but I wanted you to be aware of, of this uh, fact that uh, throughout the world, this is a story that is told. Uh, the same story, a little bit different in how it's presented, <clears throat> that there were those who were going to build a tower and uh, that God changed their languages. Well, following the Tower of Babel, uh, we find uh, that the people of, no of uh, Noah's family scattered. Uh, here's a general uh, description of how they went. So we see that Ham and his descendants uh, went into Africa. Uh, Shem and his descendants, uh, largely in the Arabian Peninsula, what we call the Middle East. Uh, Japheth and his descendants into Europe and to Asia. And from them also we have an indication of the different language families that we find today. Uh, and you can see that there's a great similarity throughout many parts of the world uh, of languages that are within the same family. Now we're going to move into what is the, the crux of our study today, and that is looking at how civilization developed following the Great Flood and the Tower of Babel. And to do that, we go to the area of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia uh, is uh, the land between rivers. Uh, that's the Greek name that was given to that land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, as you can see here on the map. Uh, the area from Mesopotamia on over into this part of the world over here, which is uh, what we sometimes call the Holy Land or Canaan and back in that period, is called the Fertile Crescent, as you can see. The Fertile Crescent indicates the area that is uh, uh, an area that is very fertile, that, that can grow things. Uh, if you were to take a straight line as the crow flies from the Persian Gulf or Sumer over to what eventually would be called Israel, but the land of Canaan, uh, that area is a desert, it's wilderness. So the Fertile Crescent is the area into which people first came 
following the Great Flood, uh, the Tower of Babel, people began to settle largely in that area. And particularly in the area called Sumer. Uh, Sumer was a civilization established around 4000 BC. Uh, in the Bible, it's called Shinar. And we find that in Genesis chapter 11. Now it's interesting when we look at the archaeological findings concerning this very first civilization, and secular historians would call this uh, the very first civilization uh, that after hundreds of thousands or, or millions of years of existence on the planet that humans finally figured out how to do some things and band together and form a civilization. Well, our perspective is different in that we believe that what the Bible says is that following the Great Flood and the Tower of Babel that uh, men began to gather in different locations and began to form societies. And uh, Sumer is the very first one. And we're going to see some indications of that as we go along here. Uh, we do so by looking at the contributions uh, that are accredited to this land of Sumer. Uh, first of all, in the area of writing. Uh, they developed what is called cuneiform or cuneiform, which is simply using a stylus on clay. Uh, here's an example of clay tablets having been imp impressioned with a stylus. Uh, and, and you can uh, try this at home. Uh, just get some clay, some modeling clay, some Play-Doh. Uh, get the end of uh, uh, some kind of a pen uh, that you can press down in and, and you can make uh, figures such as these as well. And the Sumerians are credited with inventing writing through this method. They used the cuneiform, uh, they used the stylus to create cuneiform, creating wedge-like markings on clay tablets. Uh, and th this was originally for the purpose of keeping track of products that were coming in and out of the port of Sumer. Uh, there's a lot of trade going on there along the Tigris River. Uh, and the, the clay uh, turned out to be something that was very durable after it had been baked. Uh, and it has survived better than the papyrus of Egypt. The, the writings of the Sumerians include, as they developed from simply uh, to putting down figures uh, into making words. Uh, and so they include things like poems, uh, literature, hymns, and prayers. Uh, here's how it works out in relationship to our alphabet. Uh, the different shapes and forms of the cuneiform uh, writing as it would relate to different letters. Uh, one of the earliest known law codes, the Code of Ur-Namu, was written by the Sumerians sometime between 2100 and 2050 BC. Uh, another way that they wrote, in a sense, was by using what's called a cylinder seal. You can see here the development of that uh, into something that could be rolled on clay, uh, something that would be used over and over again. And so this might be the seal of an important person, uh, sort of like his uh, signature. Uh, and so that would have to be carved into uh, this, this circular object. And then you can see the result on the, the uh, right-hand corner where it would be rolled onto clay and create an impression there. In addition to writing, the Sumerians are also credited with developing the wheel. And of course, the wheel wasn't ridden by itself. It was put on carts. Uh, they, they figured out uh, pretty quickly that it's easier to draw a wheeled cart than one without a wheel. And Sumerians mastered the technique of soldering. They also developed plywood wheels that could be fitted to oxen-drawn carts. In addition, the Sumerians are credited with developing irrigation. Uh, they built canals. They built water-raising devices. They built dikes to control flooding. Uh, they learned how to drain marshland and discovered the art of artificial insemination in plants. Uh, the, these farming innovations permitted a spectacular increase in concentrated populations. In addition, the Sumerians developed the idea of measuring land, and they used a measurement called iku, 
which is from where we get our word, acre. They developed city-states, they organized. Uh, the first cities arose here following the flood. Eridu, Ur, Uruk were some of the cities that were built. And in each city-state, political authority, <clears throat> political authority rested in a political assembly that practiced a primitive democracy. The assembly elected officers, such as the N, who was a religious and economic manager, and the Lugal, who was an emergency war leader. Over time, these positions merged into that of a king. They were involved in building. Because Mesopotamia had little stone or timber, they built with bricks hardened from mud. This is an example of something that's just been discovered recently. A brick structure unearthed at Gursu in southern Iraq was once the foundation of a bridge that spanned an ancient canal. Nearby was something which archaeologists think was a bottleneck, a possible bridge site. And uh, these were built out of mud that was then hardened or made out of bricks made from mud and hardened. Uh, unfortunately, the monumental buildings of ancient Mesopotamia have over the centuries crumbled into low mounds of mud. Recently, however, that structure of a bridge has been excavated. In addition to buildings, the Sumerians built what's called a ziggurat. Now this may have been modeled upon the original Tower of Babel, uh, but they built a number of these throughout the land. And you can see a model of it there on the top and on the bottom a, a drawing of it as well. Uh, there were different levels, there were stairways to reach up into the different levels, and uh, these ziggurats were used uh, for worship, uh, worshiping the gods. Now, another thing that we derive from the Sumerians is the method of dividing time based on the number 60. Does that sound familiar? Let's see. How many minutes in an hour? How many seconds in a minute? We still use that. You wonder why is that so? Well, I suspect that has to do with the math mathematical basis upon which God created the universe. Uh, there's a mathematical formula behind everything. I won't get into all that right now, but I think 60 is a part of that, and the Sumerians discovered or possibly knew that, which I'll get into how they might have known that. Uh, they use fractions, square roots, cube roots, squares and cubes, quadratic equations, all kinds of multiplication tables, and even a simple form of logarithms. These were all known by the Sumerians. Another contribution was the production of large boats. These were made for carrying cargo, and they were made out of reeds. Later, they added sails. They made the world's first boats using the canal system that they had developed for easy waterborne transportation of people, goods, and cattle. They also engaged in deep water seafaring using a variety of ships to reach faraway lands in search of metals, raw woods, and other materials. They produced many specialized sea vessels. It is remarkable that the very first civilization produced so many innovations. How can that be explained? The answer to this question is that Sumer was not the very first civilization on Earth. It was the first civilization following the worldwide flood, but it was preceded by civilization prior to the flood. It is my speculation that all of the innovations and inventions credited to the Sumerians were actually due to the memories of those living in the antediluvian world passed down through the inhabitants of Noah's Ark. The inhabitants of Sumer seem to even settle in a previously inhabited area. Archaeological excavations at the site of the graves of the kings or the tomb of the king brought diggers to a 10-foot band of clay several yards below the river level, eliminating flooding as a cause of this stratum. 
Below this was found fresh evidence of human habitation noticeably different from that above the clay. The archaeologist's conclusion was that the only possible explanation of these early separated epochs of settlement was the flood of Noah. Reckoning by the age of the strata containing traces of human habitation, and in this respect they are as reliable as a calendar, it could be ascertained when the great flood took place. By this archaeological evidence, it could be determined that the flood took place around 4000 BC. That, that matches what we gather from other sources, including the biblical record. Well, that's some of the innovations, that uh, so-called innovations that came about through the Sumerians and the, the source of them. Let's look a little further at the Sumerian civilization. Next, we want to look at the classes of this society. We find that the, that the Sumerian society was divided up into four classes. There were the nobles, who were the important priests and relatives of the king, and they owned much of the land. Then there were the commoners. These were the merchants, scribes, farmers, skilled workers. These were essentially the middle class. Then there were the clients. These were the class of people that worked for the nobles or for the temple, the servants in the temple. And they were paid in food and wool. Coinage didn't exist yet. They were paid in food and wool. Now, food you can understand. Why would you think they were paid in wool? I'll let you ponder that for a moment while we continue. And then the fourth category, as it is in most cultures, the lowest are the slaves. And most of the people living in Sumer were, in fact, slaves. Uh, they were slaves because they were prisoners of war. Uh, slavery, as we understand it, in uh, America in the 19th century predominantly, uh, was not the way slavery was throughout most of history. Uh, slavery came about as a result of capturing people in war. Uh, whether it's soldiers or whether it's ca capturing a particular area. And people, rather than being massacred or killed, were often enslaved. And that's where these slaves came from. Although some might have been there from punishment. Uh, that would be another thing to do. They didn't have prisons back then. Uh, throughout most of history, there haven't been prisons. Uh, punishment was meted out to according to whatever the crime was. And so for uh, some, that meant slavery. And the third element, and this doesn't change throughout most of history, and that is that debtors could turn their family into slaves to pay their debt. So either they could sell themselves into slavery or even their family in order to pay off a great debt. Uh, that was how slavery was uh, viewed throughout most of uh, history, and particularly in the ancient world. Now, for the Sumerians, the family was important. Uh, parents maintained strict order. Uh, and in Sumerian society, women could own property or even start businesses. Uh, sometimes they held important religious positions and were even chief priestesses. The occupations of the Sumerians uh, were, number one, farming. You've got to have farmers. You've got to have food. And they farmed mostly wheat, barley, vegetables, dates, and figs. Some of them were shepherds or herdsmen, and they shepherded sheep, goats, donkeys, and the oxen that were used for plowing. Uh, donkeys pulled the carts and chariots. Some of them were skilled workers, making cloth from wool. Uh, remember the sheep of the herdsmen? And uh, now they're skilled workers making wool. So that apparently was a valuable commodity, one that was very useful in Sumerian society, and that's why that was used as payment. Skilled workers also function in the area of astronomy, in law, medicine. They were sculptors and potters. In fact, the finest pottery in the history of Mesopotamia is in this early period. That might tell you something, too, about the heritage they had from before the flood. There were metalsmiths. They, they worked in armor. They made spears and swords and even chariots. Education was something that was important for the inhabitants of Sumer. Uh, education was, of course, for wealthy boys, and it was taught by the priests. There was strict discipline. If they did not behave, did not pay attention, they were beat with a cane. In fact, you see that gentleman standing at the very back of the room? That's probably 
the enforcer, <laughs> the disciplinarian, uh, the one who would be watching if, if uh, children were not uh, paying attention to their lessons. Uh, education, kids started at sunrise. But I'm sure they got off at noon, right? Mm, no. They went all the way to sunset. How's that for a long school day? There are a number of proverbs that come to us out of the Sumerian culture. Let's quickly go through some of those. Uh, you find some of them very interesting. Let what's mine stay unused, but let me use what is yours. This will hardly endear a man to his friend's household. That perpetual borrower. Yeah. Another one, he who eats much can't sleep. We've experienced that, some of us, from time to time, haven't we? Reach for the old tums. Tell a lie, then if you tell the truth, it will be deemed a lie. Build like a lord, live like a slave. Build like a slave, live like a lord. Friendship lasts a day. Kinship lasts forever. Blood is thicker than water. He who has much silver may be happy. He who has much grain may be glad. But he who has nothing can sleep. <laughs> He's not in danger of being robbed during the night. A sweet word is everybody's friend. Boy, isn't that true? Possessions are sparrows in flight, which can find no place to alight. Oh, how fleeting wealth is, right? Here's a good one. Into an open mouth, a fly enters. <laughs> so keep your mouth closed as much as you can. Here's some more Proverbs. Marry a wife according to your choice. Have a child as your heart desires. A delinquent, his mother should never have given birth to him. How sorry it is when a child grows up and behaves badly. A scribe who knows not Sumerian, what kind of scribe is he? If he doesn't know how to write in the, the native language, what good is he? A scribe whose hand moves as fast as a mouth. That's a scribe for you. Yeah, one who can write quickly. A singer whose voice is not sweet is a poor singer indeed. I'm not sure we need a proverb for that. In a city without watchdogs, the fox is the overseer. Yeah, the fox comes to steal. A loving heart builds the home. A hating heart destroys the home. A cat for its thoughts. A mongoose for its deeds. Well, those are some proverbs that were popular during Sumerian times, and we can see the wisdom of many of them. Next, we want to begin looking at the religion of the Sumerians. An, or Anu, was the chief deity and head of the Sumerian pantheon of gods. The principal deity worshipped at Ur was the Sumerian moon god Nanar, known in Akkadian as Sin. Inanna, the goddess of love, was believed to bring fertility and prosperity to Sumer through her marriage to the god Demuzi. Now next time we get together, we're going to be looking at further information we have about the uh, religion of Sumer and the gods. We're going to be looking at what they brought for sacrifice, and we're going to be examining uh, many other details about Sumerian life. But especially as we look at Sumer, and then after that we're going to be looking at ancient Egypt, we're going to see that God's hand was involved throughout the process of history. And especially as we begin to look at the relationship between biblical events and the events of ancient history, that there is a close association between the two. So I hope you'll join us next time for Discovering His Story. Someone designed everything. Can we use science to prove that God created all that we have? How old is our world and the universe? Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story.